So what we're going to do now is uh, have our next speakers come up. And this one is going to be uh, entitled Advanced Technology Work and Our Future. Uh, this panel will discuss the trajectory of exponential technologies like artificial intelligence and robotics, the tidal wave of socioeconomic issues that they have created, and the need to rapidly prepare with new approaches and solutions. So with that, we will have the panel of Brent Collins, Larry Cohen, and Neil Sahota. Hello, gentlemen. Hi, everybody. In the next 60 minutes, we're going to take you on a surprising discussion regarding technology and our future. It's surprising not necessarily because of what you might learn, but what we're talking about is really uh, unexpected, and most people can't get our heads around it. It's something that we're really just starting to understand through science fiction films, uh, and the journey into the digital era will deeply impact all of us. Uh, this is individuals, as families, as communities, as societies, and even spe uh, species. My name is Brent Collins. I'm a business consultant and have been working uh, between AI solution developers and client organizations in a number of markets and sectors. Um, the solutions we've been developing have been mainly uh, leading to transformation of value, costs, and uh, competitiveness, but ultimately displacing lots of jobs. Uh, joining me today in our panel, we're lucky to have uh, two notable figures in the world of AI and universal basic income. Neil Sahota, wave Neil, is an IBM master inventor and worldwide business development leader in the IBM Watson Group. He recently presented at the Economic Development Forum in Davos, Switzerland, and has presented to the United Nations as well. In 2011, Watson, a computer system capable of natural language processing and answering questions, won the first place prize of uh, $1 million in Jeopardy. It is now used in a range of information intensive fields, including healthcare, aerospace, law, telecommunications, financial services, government, education, weather forecasting, tax prep, fashion, and even children's toys. Larry Cohen, on the far side, is founder of buildthefloor.org, working to build coalitions and create UBI advocates across the country. He's also a founding signatory of the Economic Security Projects and runs the LA Basic Income Meetup Group. The common message in Larry's efforts is, it's time to end poverty and rebuild the middle class in America Giving cash to people is an effective way to achieve that. You can find more on our bios uh, on, on the website itself. Oops. So our agenda today is going to be, essentially, uh, I'm gonna be talking about what is uh, the digital era and exponential growth. 
Uh, Neil's going to be talking about where is it all going. We're going to have a short uh, introductory, introductory <laughs> film to universal basic income. Uh, and then Larry will talk about the uh, UBI conversation today, and then we'll wrap it up with discussion and questions. So our presentation and discussion is centered around the topic of exponential uh, transformation and the urgent need for social reform. So underlying are four primary elements which are colliding in a way that we've not seen before. The first is technology, which is a relatively recent phenomena in our world. Uh, we'll be exploring deceptive trends that are influencing us and the future generations that should cause us to pay close attention. Uh, next is sociology, and so society is really thought to be an organic process, but what happens when you're moving from an analog to a digital world, introducing wildly different value systems? What happens to the socio-political mix uh, and the control when you give a select few the influence over this kind of uh, environmental trajectory? Third is the economy. Our market economy influences our view of the world, causing us to attribute value to things like salary, education, GDP, things like that. What happens when uh, massive disruption happens and you move the value elements from one party of society to another? And then lastly, politics. We pride ourselves on being a democratic society, but you see that that's not working out so well these days. And there's a lot of disruption in our system. How might our democratic process respond to these trends that we're going to be facing? And how can we take action to strengthen our voice as citizens rather than lose our power to organizations that control the technology and the data? The Industrial Revolution began in the late 1700s and continues to shape our society today. We're now in the fourth stage of this transformation called the Fourth Industrial Revolution which really began when computers and automation began to look at things in terms of ones and zeros. This is where the digital era really started to emerge. This latest stage of, is fundamentally different because we're now fusing physical, digital, and biological disciplines all at the same time, which is gonna change everything way sooner than we can imagine. All industries, all economies, all disciplines. Uh, these changes are happening with technologies that are becoming more and more familiar. Every day we hear about emerging breakthroughs in robotics, artificial intelligence, blockchain, nanotechnology, quantum computing, biotechnology, Internet of Things, 3D printing, and autonomous vehicles. Their growth and success is dependent on data, lots of data, uh, lots of your data. And these are technologies that will begin to challenge our ideas of what it means to be human as well. Uh, this is a, a chart that shows how life expectancy has shifted across uh, classes in recent decades. And I think you can argue that this is correlated with the dawn of the uh, digital era. So let's take a quick mathematical uh, interlude here. Uh, we need to start thinking in terms of exponential instead of linear. Um, it's important because until the digital age, our rate of growth has been progressing in a relatively straight line, which is linear. Um, exponentially, uh, exponential basically means it's the rate of growth is increasing proportionally with each step that you take. So for example, if I'm gonna take 30 st or 10 steps, each step is about three feet, so I'll travel 30 feet in 10 steps. If I take an exponential uh, path, like we're now on with technology, the first step will be three feet, the second will be six, the, the third will be 12, and so forth. Within 10 steps, I'm two-thirds of a mile already. Uh, within uh, 20 steps, I'm around the planet. And 30 steps, I'm, I've gone a billion meters uh, several times around the planet. So we're now moving into this different way of thinking that our own biology has not really gotten used to yet. So let's apply this to a framework that explains what's driving this rapid change from a market and business perspective. 
as you can imagine, this is called the 6Ds exponential framework. The framework represents a chain reaction of technological progression, a roadmap of the rapid development that always leads to enormous upheaval and opportunity. The first D is digitization, which is where it all begins and where the growth materializes from. In 2012, IBM estimated that we all leave an average of 500 megabytes of data per day footprint on the planet. And if you wanted to back that up and, and uh, put that into paper form, front and back, 12 font, you could stack that up and it would reach, this is just on one person, from the earth to the sun and back twice. But that was in 2012 and we're going through exponential change, so you can imagine that that number has grown quite a bit since 2012. The field of uh, AI research was founded in a workshop held at Dartmouth College uh, back in 1956. That's 62 years ago. But many people are just starting to learn about artificial intelligence, what it really means. Uh, when something starts being digitized, it has this initial period of growth that's quite deceptive uh, because the exponential trains don't, trends don't really grow very fast at first. We're talking about, you, look, you can't really see this very well, but uh, when you're talking about 0.01 doubling, it becomes 0.02 and then 0.04. You really don't get the, the, the breakthrough progress until you get into the whole numbers, and then you get to 100% with just the last few steps. And this is where we're at now. Disruption happens as people and standards are completely replaced. AI technologies like speech recognition are beginning to do this. Uh, you can see here, this is showing the uh, error rate or the accuracy rate starting to decrease for computers and uh, map to the, uh, or, or surpass the uh, level of human error rates. Same is happening for image recognition, where error rates for image labeling have uh, gone well below what humans uh, perform at. And then you've also probably noticed that with your phone, it's starting to recognize the questions that you're asking it more effectively. This is because the underlying technology continuously learns, and then those updates are replicated across all platforms. So learning isn't just happening with one system, it's across the entire system, which makes it entirely more efficient. Uh, dematerialization is the next D. That's the fact that over the past 20 years, we've been able to move from these physical products that were extremely expensive and bulky, like radios and cameras and GPS and videos and phones, and now fit into one simple device in your pocket. Now, uh, next is demonetization. When computing began, hardware and software were expensive and bulky. Uh, the first computer, the ENIAC, costs, uh, this was developed about, uh, well, back in, back in the early 50s, it was a 30-ton advanced calculator uh, that co cost about half a million dollars. Now this all comes for free on your phone. Uh, money is increasingly removed from the equation as technologies become cheaper, often to the point of becoming free. And so you have this complete transformation of markets in our society. Airbnb is dematerializing and demonetizing hotels. Uber is replacing taxis. Skype is uh, replacing long distance, etc. Once something is digitized, more people have access to it. Powerful technologies are no longer only for governments and large corporations. For this reason, the average cost of starting a business has decreased from an average of $1 million 15 years ago to $5,000 to start a business now, on average. And this is not just for your local market, but for the entire global market as well. So uh, let's look more at AI. What is AI? Uh, it's a very broad field of study dedicated to complex problem solving uh, using data. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, and it's a data-driven approach focusing on creating algorithms that have the ability to learn from data without being programmed. This is a massive shift in uh, computing itself. D 
deep learning is a subfield of machine learning focused on complex neural networks that automatically learn hierarchical relationships and use that to make predictions or uh, pro uh, process information. So basically, the more data you can provide, the better. The basic idea is that we can make observations and plug them into a mathematical model which begins to teach itself or it can combine and replicate human expertise to understand relationships across giant pools of data to draw conclusions, make predictions, or even make decisions. Unlike humans, computers can conduct an iterative process on a massive scale that continuously learns. So once an algorithm learns that what a particular tumor looks like, uh, all uh, algorithms looking for cancer can start to leverage that knowledge. Uh, the other good thing about technology is uh, it doesn't take breaks, but of course, that's just when you look at the technology itself. When you start to infuse that into our social system, that's, uh, that introduces a lot of trade-offs. So data becomes this new currency. It's a transformative evolutionary process that allows us to start to gain insight. What this shows is how we're moving from kind of a hindsight perspective into an insight and then a foresight uh, model where we previously used data to describe what was happening, then diagnose what was happening. Now we're moving towards predicting what's going to happen and then next we'll be prescribing what should happen. And these, these are massive shifts in how we think. There are no doubt incredible benefits that will come from all of this and are compelling us to take massive leaps of faith without necessarily knowing all the risks and trade-offs. Over a million lives are lost each year to traffic accidents. So as a society, we're going to definitely trade off uh, uh, automated or manual trans transportation with automating transportation. And that will displace four million professional drivers as a trade-off uh, uh, as well. Similar trade-off will be made for seven million data entry jobs and for multitudes of radiologists and farmers and lawyers and accountants. So um, we're now at the point where there is no going back. Uh, we've developed a world embedded with computers, smartphones, advanced networks, cameras, sensors, intelligent machines, robots, 3D printers, virtual reality, augmented reality, synthetic biology, DNA manipulation, and these kind of creepy machines that are starting to be part of our evolutionary process. So with uh, all this amazing technology, what's the problem? The big problem is that unless we take decisive action right now, it's not going to just exacerbate our existing flaws, but lock in horrible inequities. The United States is one of the richest, most powerful, and technologically innovative countries, but none of it is being harnessed to address massive social and moral problems. Um, uh, rather than go into the detail, actually, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just skip forward because I wanna get to the uh, next presentations. But uh, the point here is that we have a lot of trade-offs to uh, manage and that we're currently making those trade-offs as a society and that technology is an opportunity to start to resolve these issues, not lock them in. So without further ado, I'll uh, hand this over to Neil who will talk about where, where technology is taking us now. All right, I want you guys to be honest with me. How many guys ever dream about what the future holds? I don't see everybody's hands up. Come on, none of you have ever dreamed about winning the lotto? <laughs> Taking that money, hopping in your limo, driving up your backyard to your helicopter, flying over your private jet, you know, cruise on over to Paris for lunch or something? Come on. 
Well, let's maybe talk about something a little easier than winning the lotto. Right? What does the future hold? How many of you guys have a smartphone? Does anybody know when the first iPhone came out? Or 2002? Any other guesses? 2000 what? Five? Any other guesses? 1891, 776. The uh, first iPhone actually came out June 29th, 2007. Oh, yeah, I know. It's uh, going to turn 11 years old soon. How, how much does a smartphone change your life? Right? You we do. Think about personally, professionally, things are a lot different, right? How many of you guys have ever used Uber? Can you use Uber without a smartphone? Probably not, right? The, the power of smartphones is that they enable the app economy, as they say, right? And nobody could fathom 11 years ago what would happen. Nobody would have predicted Uber, for example. Now we're talking about AI, which is the next big computing model. We call it the third generation of computing. So people always ask me, like, what does the future hold? Well, let's think about it. Let's imagine a world where we can have AIs working with CNI dogs, right? To get a CNI dog, you know, we have to watch the dogs, try and figure out when they're still very young, which, which ones are gonna make the best ones, train them, match them with a person, and hopefully the match sticks, right? What do you think the success rate of that, that process is today? Man, this guy asks a lot of questions, huh? It's about 30%. So now imagine a world where you have an AI working with humans, looking at the dogs and their puppies, seeing how just based on their interacting with other dogs, figure out which dogs will make the best CNI dogs by the time the puppy is seven days old. Then works with the humans to actually train the dog, right? Create like a personalized training curriculum for the dog, and then do a psychographic analysis of the dog's personality and psychographic per analysis of the human's personality and do some matchmaking. Think we do better than 30%? How would you guys like a party? <laughs> uh, I love that reaction. I, I know where the after party is now. <laughs> All right? Imagine if we had a little AI assistant helping us throw a party, right? That it's helping us pick the music based on the social sentiment, that it's adjusting the lights, changing the colors of the lights, the shapes, everything based on how people feel and are moving, how they're dressed. Even to the level that the AI has created all the recipes for the food that's served, right? Based on people's palates, preferences, allergens, whatever it might be. Imagine, you know, um, an AI that can help you evaluate people like players, right? You're trying to figure out who's gonna win the game and it looks at not just statistics, but you know, what kind of trash talk might be effective? Does this guy have a, a blocker against this team? Or if you've ever hired a person or looked for a job, right? They look for two things. Are you qualified? Are you gonna fit in with my corporate culture, my team? Well, we can interview, test for qualifications, but how do you know if a person's actually a fit culturally? Right? Well, what if an AI can look at your Facebook posts, your Instagrams, your LinkedIn, your resume, any public information, generate that profile and tell the company whether you're a fit or not? Right? What if we can have AIs watch movies? Right? And by watching a movie, actually generate the optimal trailer to bring people out based on the emotionality of each scene. Sound pretty cool? I don't know, you guys are kind of lethargic. Sound pretty cool? All right, sounds exciting and scary, I don't blame you. Well, we have a bit of a problem though, right? A lot of stuff out there that you say is AI, there's a lot of pie in the sky dreams. Like, we, we gotta ground ourselves in reality, right? The problem is all these examples I gave you are not the future, they're the present. Every example I've actually given you so far has been around for about two years. What? Seriously? Yeah. Right? People always talk about AI being the future. I hate to break it to you, but AI is not the future anymore. It's the present. Right? And I 
I have the honor of traveling around the world and working with lots of organizations, you know, government agencies, nonprofits, NGOs. And I have to tell them that if they're thinking about using AI today to help them, they're about three years behind the curve. I see a lot of sad faces out there. <laughs> it, don't lose all hope, right? Change is inevitable, right? Human history is littered with change. It's just that change is coming faster, right? And every change of things coming faster and faster. So we can look at this. I know there's a lot of fear out there from people about what is this going to mean? What is this going to mean for like, jobs and people? And, you know, are, are we going to create Skynet and it's going to eradicate us off the face of the planet? Right? But at the same token, people are looking at what can we do with AI to help us? Can it help us with personalized medicine, with personalized education? Right? I can tell you the United Nations has been talking about trying to develop robot judges for about a year now. Right? You're talking about one of the biggest, most bureaucratic, slowest organizations. But they're even trying to be very forward thinking about what could be done. So there's a lot of opportunity, obviously commercially, but also for social good. But we have a, we have a choice to make. Right, you're probably, some of you, I heard you say this is scary. You're probably looking at some of these things and saying, well, what does this mean for us as, as people, as a society? Are some jobs going to go away? Yeah, probably. All right, think about self-driving cars. How far away do you think self-driving cars, how many years away are they going to be away from being the norm? Five, 13, three. It's probably coming a lot faster than we realize. If, if I had to take a guess myself, I would say it's probably gonna happen within seven years, right? Singapore has already got self-driving buses, self-driving taxis. There's actually self-driving cars on the roads of California today. So next time you see a car on the freeway without any driver, you know why. But I, I had the honor of going to speak at Mobile World Conference this past year and I was in Barcelona and in Spain, the taxi drivers are celebrating a great victory in that they were actually able to boot Uber out. Right? So they don't have that much competition. They have a monopoly on transporting people around. They're really happy. And I was talking to my cab driver one day about it. And I asked him, like, well, what about self-driving cars? And he's like, ah, that's like 30, 40 years away. I think they need to figure it out. And I had to break the news to him that it's already happening in Singapore. Right? It's one thing to you know, try and beat you know, competition like that, but self-driving cars are going to be the norm. What do you do then? So these are the questions we've got to ask ourselves and ask ourselves what kind of skills, roles, and more importantly jobs are going to exist in the future and what do we do with people? Can we retrain our existing workforce? Can we train the workforce of tomorrow to be ready for those type of jobs? And are there going to be, are there going to be a sufficient number of jobs out there for all of us? These are heavy items to tackle, and I don't have enough time to do that because I probably need like four or five days. But I'm going to hand it over to Larry to talk a little bit about one option with UBI. Thank you. I'm going to put a film on that really summarizes what UBI is because there's really a language uh, that you need to start to understand in a different perspective um, that I think is easily said with cartoons, which is what we'll show now. Um, okay, thanks. Ho hopefully that gave you a good primer on what UBI is. Uh, Larry now is an expert on the changes that we need to go through as a society to move towards this kind of model. And let's see if I can get the presentation to come up. Why don't I, why don't you go ahead and start talking while I bring up your presentation. So, Larry All right, Cohen. so the video is really interesting. I disagree, at, just at the very end where they say, we still don't know if we should work toward basic income, I myself, I'm an advocate for universal basic income. I believe in universal basic income. I believe that with the UBI, we can help build the foundation for what I believe should be our 21st century society, 
a society where people aren't in fear or living in poverty or worrying about this growing insecurity and instability that is happening because of the very technology that we are able to have created and generated and, and shared amongst, amongst ourselves. Like we should allow our technology to take the work and the stress off of our lives, of all of our lives, so that we can engage in meaning, fulfilling lives. And I think UBI helps us transition into that future that I believe we should be trying to build. There are a lot of different parts that the video brought up that I would love to get questions on and to talk further about, uh, whether it's how we paid for it or some of the studies that have been done, some of the people that have supported it over the years. This is not a new idea, and the tech industry is not the first group to start supporting basic income. It has been around for hundreds of years. It, a form of basic income almost passed in the United States. We were the country to come closest to implementing a form of basic income. Uh, we had uh, fans such as Martin Luther King Jr. and economists such as Milton Friedman, some people from the left and the right, in the 70s almost pass a bill with Richard, Ni Richard Nixon being the primary sponsor. So this is not a new idea, but it takes on an even more advanced reason to bring it about as we go through this, this constant changing of technologies impacting each other's lives and how we can earn a livelihood in today's economy. So what I do want to talk about is the recent conversations about UBI and, and sort of just catch you guys up to speed a little bit because there's been a lot of growing conversation about UBI in the political spheres, not just in individuals talking about it and sharing about it, but in our, in our politics today. So in Hillary Clinton's book, What Happened, which was sort of discussing the 2016 election, she has a very interesting piece in there, which most people didn't know about, and I had no idea uh, that this was a thing until I read it, which was her campaign actively considered offering a universal basic income as a policy for the nation. And I can only imagine what the conversation could have been if that had come up at the time. What she had found is that she had read this really interesting book called uh, With Liberty and Dividends for All by a guy named Peter Barnes. And the argument with that is saying that the resources, the natural resources of the United States is not owned by any one individual. And these natural resources pr provide an immense amount of wealth. And that wealth should be shared or co-owned by all of its inhabitants because no one person is responsible for it, but we are all co-owners of the land in which we live in. The best example of this is in Alaska. In Alaska, every single resident, simply by living there, and doing nothing else but living there, earns a small basic income, not a full universal, not a full basic income, but a guaranteed income based on the value of the wealth that has been generated from the land in the form of oil revenue and has been put into a fund that has then been paying dividends to all of its citizens, to all of its residents for the past 35 years. It was implemented under a Republican governor and it was seen as ensuring that some form of the value of the land, which again, no one is responsible for, we all inherited it, that value was going to be shared among all of us, all the people of Alaska. If you've ever seen the Simpsons movie, where the family drives up to Alaska and they get to the toll booth, and they, they meet the guy there and he says, welcome to Alaska, here's $1,000. And Homer goes, woohoo! You know, there's a reason for that. That is actually based in truth. If you go to Alaska and live there, you receive this dividend. And there have been experiments looking at what kinds of impacts it's made in Alaska. And we find that there isn't an increase in unemployment. There's actually uh, an increase in people being able to purchase their basic needs. There is uh, not inflation where if everyone's receiving money, wouldn't ever all the prices go up? But no, we see that actually stores put on major sales because they have to compete with one another for this income that people are now more free to choose where they go shopping and people don't waste it on drugs and alcohol, they pay for their basic needs because those are the things that people are trying to do. Those are the, the things that people need to do to live their lives. And so we've had this experiment going for decades and Hillary Clinton and the, the Clinton campaign thought about trying to offer this to the entire country, sort of a Alaska for America model with that being the basis. Now ultimately they didn't go forward with it, but I can only imagine that if we didn't have that conversation just a few years ago, we're going to have the conversation and should start having the conversation today because I, I think it is really valuable. Some more recent conversations taking place. Uh, Chris Lee is a state representative in Hawaii and he is also recognizing the changes going on in his state. 
He's seeing the kinds of jobs that are, are leaving and changing and how insecurity and instability is affecting all the people of Hawaii. So what he has proposed is a group that has unanimous, a bill that unanimously passed in the legislation, bringing a group together to explore the idea that we should ensure that all Hawaiians have basic economic security. And one method to do that would be through a universal basic income. So this is gathering a large group of stakeholders from across the state and understanding what things might be necessary to change for the future of Hawaii and the Hawaiians. On the, on the other side here is Mayor Michael Tubbs. He's 27 and he's the mayor of Stockton, California. And he recognized the kinds of challenges his city is going through with the economy ever changing, the, the jobs and the kinds of activities that people are able to earn an income are constantly at risk and are constantly being disrupted. So he's gonna be working with a group called the Economic Security Project, of which I'm a member. And the ESP has given a grant to help provide the, the city of Stockton with a guaranteed income experiment. So Mayor Michael Tubbs and his team are going to look at what will happen to these families, 100 families, if they receive $500 a month for a couple of years. And to see what kinds of changes happen when people have a guaranteed income. Not enough to you know, retire on and do nothing, but enough to help pay for their basic needs. Because an idea about universal basic income is the recognition that we all have these basic needs. You know, food, shelter, you know, uh, those basic unmet needs that impact our lives greatly if we can't take care of them. Nothing else can happen until those basic needs are met. So several experiments are being taken place in the country right now, but I actually don't believe we need any more trials or any more of the you know, ways to see why we might should do this. So I'm in sort of awe and excited to talk about this gentleman. His name is Andrew Yang and he is running for, for the Democratic nominee to be president in 2020. Now, Andrew Yang is running on a platform of universal basic income as an official economic policy to ensure that every American receives $1,000 a month if you're an adult and from the ages of 18 to 64. The idea being that a universal basic income would help provide basic economic security, dignity, and opportunity to all Americans. And his rationale is coming from the world of Silicon Valley, being a venture capitalist, but also founding a nonprofit called Venture for America, where he connected college graduates with in, uh, growing startups across the country. And in his travels, he noticed just how deep the problems are. That it's not necessarily just a need to re-educate people, to give them you know, more information about what they could do, but the very fundamental nature of work and our jobs and our labor is completely changing in front of our eyes, and that we need to take drastic steps, important steps, to ensure that everyone feels like they have a basic level of investment being made into them so that they can create a meaningful life for themselves and then for their, for their society, for their family, and for their community. So this is a very ambitious goal to run for president, as we all know, but the idea being that Andrew and those who believe in basic income want to have this conversation. We need to have this conversation now. We don't want to wait any longer to talk about how a universal basic income or policies like this can help impact people's lives for the better, to create this foundation so that we can all lead and achieve meaningful, productive lives. It helps challenge the very notion of what work is. It helps challenge the notion of what it means to be uh, so a productive citizen and it helps give the idea that there are many more ways to, to improve our society and our country than simply trying to earn a living. It opens the notion of what we can do in our future. And it helps ensure that we build this strong foundation going forward and have our technology working for all of us, not just for a select few. So with that, I will close my talking portion, but I really want to hear your questions because this is a big idea and this is my passion, is to talk about this idea, to explore this idea, and to get more people to understand just how transformative this, this idea is. So I really hope you have any questions, because if you don't, I'm gonna have to just keep coming up with things to talk about. So, come over here. Did they measure the 
So I believe you're talking about the uh, the income. Yes. Okay. So the so what did they measure the positives and negatives uh, in Alaska? I believe. Right. From this mic. Okay. One mic just shot because I start to walk around. So <laughs> some of the effects that they recognized in Alaska. Uh, again, there wasn't a decrease in work or employment. There actually was an increase to allow people to reach different kinds of jobs. If they were part-time, they were able to better access those jobs. They were able to recognize and measure that there wasn't an increase in drugs or alcoholic purchases. Uh, and they have been able to measure that the level of equality among the residents of Alaska is, as they might call it, the most equal of states. So that the level of income inequality is lower in Alaska because of this dividend that is ensuring that everyone has this base or a, a guaranteed income coming from it. And it also, almost an important side note from that is the idea that they don't view it as a handout in Alaska. They don't even really think of it as something that has been given to them. It's something that they inherited because of the value of the land that no one of them is responsible for. And it goes to this notion that the people of Alaska really view this as something that is provided to all of them. And so it's, it's a really, it's a universal idea that is a very highly polled there and that many people don't want to have taken away because it is provided to everyone. So there isn't one group fighting another group over who should get it and why they're deserving versus the undeserving, but they ensure that it's sort of a communal aspect to being an Alaskan. And I think that's a really important point to take, which is that it's this idea of this, this one group versus the other and fighting what one has or might, might lose to another group is something that is driving a wedge between us in so many different areas of our lives that when you talk about such a universal idea that we, we ensure this universal understanding of you know, basic needs for everybody and entrusting each other with that responsibility and that ability to go have those basic needs met, that creates a level of trust and understanding that I think we are sorely missing today and we desperately need more of. Uh, there are other experiments in other countries that do cash transfer programs. The biggest and uh, most notable one right now is going on in Kenya. Uh, there's an organization called Give Directly, which provides direct cash transfers to really poor, low-income communities across the world. And they're focusing a 12-year study with thousands of participants in Kenya. And they're a year into this study. And one of the most important aspects of the work that they're able to be measuring, especially right now anecdotally, which is stories being shared from those who are receiving this basic income, is that when it's not just a few people receiving a basic income, but it's the entire community, there's a level of, uh, there's an aspect of trust and understanding and believing in each other that didn't exist before. There's a level of cooperation and striving to improve each other's lives that was missing before there's almost this cohesive fabric that's being formed within the community, especially with individuals who may have thought that they were being left behind or left out of that community in the first place. Because no longer are those who are living there have to prove themselves as just earning income in the traditional sense, but people are able to start their own businesses, people are able to uh, take care of their kids and, and provide basic needs for their children. There are other forms of work that are being done that aren't necessarily just generating income but are extraordinarily important to be done. And I think in the United States, we could take a lesson from that. Like, the kind, of, the kind of the future of work that we need to be thinking about isn't just income generating, because there's so many kinds of labor out there, there's so many kinds of work that we do today that isn't income generating, but are super important. If you're taking care of your family, whether it's your kids or your, your adult parents or your grandparents, that is an incredible amount of important work that you're doing. It may not be paid, but it is incredibly important to be done. If you're participating in the open source movement, or if you're contributing to a community, or you're volunteering locally, or you're passionate about an issue that you want to raise attention to and make a change about, all these things that you're doing are really important and is, I would consider, work. But it's not paid. Does that make that any less important? I might argue that it's even more important than a lot of the jobs kind of the BS jobs that we do day to day 
that we really shouldn't be doing with our time and our energy, but we have to do because we have to earn an income to be able to support ourselves and pay for our basic needs. So it really helps transform the ideas of what we should be doing with our lives and our time and our energy when you have an, a system that allows you to better pursue those options and to recognize that with basic economic security, dignity, and opportunity, we can better reach those kinds of jobs, those better kinds of work for everybody and give people the freedom to choose for themselves what kind of work they want to be doing. We have time for uh, one more question. There's a gentleman right here. Over here, right here. Oh, sorry. Hi. Yeah, this is also for Larry. So, um, Larry, when I was 19, I had a car accident and I was put on social security disability which um, was a huge box. I mean, they basically you know, said, look, if you earn more than X, we're gonna shove you into the box and we're gonna take away your ability to get you know, medical care, so on and so forth. So um, comparatively speaking, what I'm saying is, how, how will this not implement, implement more government control by creating you know, a universal basic income? Is, is there a way to keep the government from interceding in this? So the, the, the question, if I heard it right, is to understand how the government will not be just sort of right, in everyone's right. life. How, how, how will they implement this program while at the same time not forcing us back into the box? Got it. So again, I think as part of the video helped demonstrate the idea of the welfare state or when people are, uh, the, the system that we have today can incentivize people to not, not necessarily get out of their situation, but it must, it's a lot harder to get out of the situation you're in if as soon as you start earning any income, you lose all the support you had to get to that point in the first place. And I think a great way to summarize UBI is that it doesn't give you the ability to go do uh, nothing, but it gives you the ability to go do anything. And ironically, those words were spoken by Warren Buffett when he talked about what kind of uh, money and income he would want, want to leave his children. And, and the aspect is that with a UBI, you can always earn on top of it. You know, that is the floor. That's so why I call my site and my advocating for this, build the floor. Because this is the floor, that's the starting point that we have for everybody. So earning on top of that is up to you. You can earn as much as you want. You can earn, you know, as much as, you know, Bill Gates or Bezos or Zuckerberg or anyone else we know by one name. But you can, earn on top of whatever it is above the basic income. What we're saying is that you can never fall below that, that floor, no matter what you do. If you make a mistake, if you take a risk, if something goes wrong, you can never fall below that. And so with the government helping provide this basic income is distributing it, you know, we already have a large program that exists today that has a, a large amount of the population on it that ensures or that provides cash directly to them, which is Social Security. And I would argue that Social Security has actually enabled, I mean, a lot of the evidence has shown how Social Security has helped bring a generations of seniors out of poverty. But also, seniors are pretty much the most active uh, participants in government today, I think, in large part because they are in such a large constituency, being able to have their basic needs met to advocate for things that are important to them. So I think that the, the power in which people with a basic income would be receiving would actually allow civic uh, in, improvements in civic discourse and civic action among all the citizens because you're better positioned to be able to make the to make the statements and have the time and the energy to go fight for the things that you believe in. You'll be able to you be able to better say no to poor working conditions and to say no to labor that you don't believe should be done unless it's paid with a commiserable rate or wage, and you can say yes to opportunities that you believe you you want to go pursue. So. With a UBI, we could actually get more of a representative government because more people would be able to run for office, to advocate for certain ideas, to go vote. Right now, it is so difficult for people to take the time and the energy to, from work to go vote because it's, we've made it really impossible for people to find that opportunity to leave work. If people had a basic income, they could be in a better position to say, you know what? I'm gonna be able to take these couple of hours off to go do this or I'm not going to work for an employer that forces me to, 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 to not be able to vote because I, have my base, I can cover my basic needs and I can better negotiate for myself what I believe I should be able to do with my time in my life. So I think ultimately a basic income would actually improve 
the amount of uh, civic connection between those of us who live in it and being able to participate in, in the civic duty in the first place. Thank you very much. Thanks. We'd like to thank Brent Collins, Larry Cohen, and Neil Sohota for their presentation this afternoon. Can you give them all a round of applause?